Just tickled to be here. Uh, my name is Jerry, and this is my wife Barbara, and uh, we are going to um, see what the Holy Spirit shows us on Matthew chapter 18. And uh, open your Bible, get ready, and uh, here we go. So uh, I am so excited about this chapter. Uh, God's got something to say for each one of us here today. Uh, it has been a, a real challenge around here today, so I'm, uh, I just know that when, when that happens, God's got something to say. Hallelujah. So uh, open your Bible, get ready. Here we go. Matthew chapter 18. Father, we love you. Father, we, we recognize you, omnipotent, all-powerful, before eternity began, you're the only one that lives outside of eternity. Father, we just give you praise. Father, we acknowledge your greatness, your omnipotence. We acknowledge, acknowledge you as, as King of kings and Lord of lords. We bow in reverence to you. Father, we thank you that you are so careful and mindful of us father we thank you Lord, that your word says if two or three will gather together in my name i'll be there father according to malachi chapter three father when when brothers get together and talk about the word of god father angels record that incident in heaven father so i thank you lord that, hallelujah that we're going to keep the angels busy father because we're going to talk about the goodness of the lord and we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Holy Spirit, come in, open our hearts that we might perceive, recognize, and understand Jesus in a whole new way. We come hungry. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Amen. Good praying, Jerry. Matthew chapter 18. Uh, this is the fourth dissertation of Jesus. And uh, I have mentioned all the, the three previous, and I'm just wondering if anybody picked up on that. So uh, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount and how citizens should act in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 10 is the second dissertation. It's where he commissions his disciples and releases them to uh, the expansion of the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus taught the parables and what the kingdom of God would look like and does look like on earth. And chapter, uh, the fourth dissertation, that's what we're going to cover uh, most of tonight, chapter 18 through 20, Jesus warns of being a hindrance to the kingdom of God and the necessity of forgiveness in the kingdom of God. So that's uh, where we're going to start off tonight is the fourth dissertation and if your bible has uh red letters of what jesus said it's easy to pick up on each of these dissertations because the whole page is red imagine that that's a clue for you that uh, this is a a, a a dissertation and nobody else does any talking other than jesus yeah. so um we are going to start in verse one and see, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? That's the first time. Most of the time, it's the Pharisees and the scribes and, the, and those guys coming and asking Jesus. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child. He put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, uh, I think they were looking to see, uh, you know, what their position was going to be in the kingdom of God. Were they going to be rulers or, or uh, potentates or uh, that they would have authority in the kingdom of heaven? And, and Jesus sat them down pretty quick and said, uh, the lowly, the humble, the meek, uh, they are the ones that will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So uh, I really would have liked to have been that little boy that day. It's just a little girl. No, nope, it doesn't. It says, and they put him in the midst of them. Ah, uh, it sure does, doesn't it? My goodness. Well, that's a first. <laughs> that Jerry was actually right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm going to note that one. Yeah. So uh, I really would have liked to have been that little boy who came and, and found a seat at uh, Jesus' feet and all the, all the other um, apostles, the disciples sitting around, you know, they were all up here like this and, and the little boy was, uh, I bet they started scrunching down. I bet they started getting low and uh, trying to get down on his level because uh, Jesus goes on to describe that the child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And if you don't become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Barbara and I were discussing what attributes of a child was Jesus looking for? Okay. Well, first of all, there's a difference between childishness mm -hmm. and childlikeness. Very good. Childishness, childishness Rude. is whiny, Arguing over little petty things that children argue over. Disobedient. Disobedient. Sometimes obedient. Mm -hmm. But they're self-motivated. Everything with a child is centered on themselves. I can do this myself. They have to be taught how to share. That's not innate in a person. We have to learn how to share our toys. We have to learn how to play good in the in the sand pit. So um, childishness is not what Jesus was referring to. Jesus says we have to become like little children. So childlikeness in comparison is humble, trusting, and, and trusting, and this is, the, I think, what Jesus really was driving at, because actually the um, the disciples were arguing over petty things. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Well, I'm better than you are. My daddy's bigger than you are. You know, my mom is going to come get you. You know, all those little things that you can just hear little kids say when they get in little arguments. I got to go up on the mountain with him, though. Yeah, well, good for you. Yeah. Absolutely. That one for me. But I think what Jesus was really getting at here was to be childlike means we are to be dependent on someone bigger or greater than we are. Dependent to bring about. Child, a child is dependent on their parent, their guardian, someone bigger and greater than they are to feed them, provide for them. Put a roof over their head, clothe them, educate them. A child like is a dependent person, mm -hmm. not someone who is childish and wanting their own way and being self centered, but child dependent, child like being that dependent person on the father. Our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus was driving at. That's what Jesus wanted the disciples to see compared to them and compared to the little boy that they sat in the center of the group. Mm -hmm. And that phrase, like these little ones, like these little ones, like a little child, 
is like seven times in the first 14 verses. Jesus was really trying to make a point to be childlike in being dependent on the greater father. Okay. So we, we have to be dependent on him for our direction, for help, for resources, for protection, provision, uh, for the blessedness of his presence. Uh, we have to be dependent on, on his presence. So uh, let's pick up, and that was excellent, by the way. Uh, verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So here it is again, a uh, little child. And if we would remember, uh, Jesus said, uh, earlier, if you receive a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. And if you receive a righteous person, you receive a righteous person's reward. And here in verse 5, anyone who receives a child in my name receives me. So this child is compared to one who believes in the word of God, is walking after Jesus, walking with Jesus. It uh, may uh, include actually uh, his disciples because he called his disciples his little children. So uh, whoever receives one of these, these disciples in my name receives me. And whoever causes one of these little ones. So uh, a little little background, uh, this 18th chapter is the, is compared to the Christian ethics book. This is how do we, how do we interact? How do we interact with each other? What are the rules in the kingdom of God? So the first thing we see is we must be humble. We must Humility is a necessity and a characteristic in the kingdom of God, okay? The second thing that we see that whosoever receives one of these receives me. So we have to take responsibility for those around us that we do not lead or cause anyone to sin because there's great penalty in our actions, the penalty is trying to go swimming with a millstone powder around your neck. And, and I've seen a millstone, and it's huge. I mean, no life preserver is going to save you with a millstone. It is bigger than I ever thought that it would be. I mean, it's a small, huge. a small millstone. It's still huge. This says a great millstone fastened around your neck. Uh, so. There is no hope. There is no hope for the one who causes one of these little ones who is, okay, let's go back, who is dependent upon and looking to the Father for their direction, for help, and all resources. They come walking in humility, and then you come and call us one of these little ones who are doing their best to walk after Christ, to sin. It ain't going to be good. That ain't going to look good at all. Okay. Uh, Barbara, won't you read verse <clears throat> seven? Because they're tired of me reading. <clears throat> Woe to the, to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. Okay. So here we see that we must take responsibility in verse five to lead others in the right way. And now we see that our effects, that our deeds and our words and our life affects those around us because there are those following behind us and they're watching. 
people are watching. Woe to him who causes temptation. How, how great is this woe? Victor, can you silence your, your mic for us there, sir? Thank you. Uh, it is better that you cut off your hand, that you cut off your foot, or anything else that would, that would interfere with your walk with God if you are continually tempted and caused to sin, it is better to remove that thing from your life than to spend eternity in hell. So we see that uh, the tendency of an athlete. We see the nature of an athlete right here. What is an athlete willing to do? What is an athlete willing to, to give up in order to win the prize, in order to simply uh, finish the race? Sometimes finishing the race is, uh, is a huge accomplishment. So Jesus is saying that we must be willing to lay down anything and everything that would get in the way of us finishing the race and, and having that, that crown of life, the prize of eternity, so that we might have something to present to the Father when this life, this short day is done, that what are you willing to give up? up? What are you willing to, remember last week we talked about what is a man willing to give for his soul? There is no price for the soul. There is nothing that is worth selling one's soul for. And that's what Jesus is alluding to here. If your hand or your foot or your eye or anything uh, cause you to sin, get rid of it. It's better to be maimed and crippled and, and lacking than to spend eternity in hell. Amen. Amen. So verse um, number 10. May I? Please do. So I wish you would. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Uh, that, that's enough right there. It's just stop right there. Um, go back who is the little one the little one is the one whose nature is they walk in humility they walk in dependence they walk in desperate need for help direction and all their resources are coming from that one that is in authority over them see that you do not despise Okay, so earlier we, we saw that uh, if you receive this one, then you, uh, verse 5, if you receive the little one, then you receive me. Verse 7, don't tempt this little one. Don't get in their way. Verse 10 says, uh, don't even think bad thoughts about this little one. Do not say or think. Do not despise. Do not hold them in bad light. Do not hold them in bad light. Wow. Are we able to see that we have responsibility? Every one of us in this group has a Bible in front of us. Every one of us is will be held accountable by the way we walk, by the way we lead, by the way we speak. Barbara's dad had a favorite passage in the Bible, and he, he said it over and over and over again. You never prayed with Dad Crop without him saying, Barbara's last name is Crop, K-R-O-B. And you never heard Dad Crop pray 
He always concluded his prayer with let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Verse 10. For I tell you that their angels always see the face of God who is in heaven. Don't mess with one of my little ones. Don't mess with my little ones. Ah, uh, it is, they are valuable. They are cared for. And we're fixing to see how, to what degree that they are cared for. When we do these things to little ones, to new believers, to people who are dependent on their father. Right. When we do these things against them, all it does is reveal our self-righteousness. It truly does reveal what's in our heart more than it reveals the littleness or the inadequacy. inadequacies of the little ones. It reveals our self-righteousness, which is never a pretty sight which is never a pretty sight. So just keep that in mind. Um, okay. One, another thing that Barbara and I talked about this week was uh, just because they are dependent doesn't make them naive. True. It doesn't. We just should all be dependent. We should all be like that. Right. But, uh, and, and just because they are dependent on God doesn't make them ignorant. Amen. Uh, okay, so humility and meekness uh, are are one of the characteristics, some of the characteristics that he's talking about. So, uh, and I'm just trying to contrast it with, particularly though I can't speak to those of you in another country or in another continent. But those of us here in the Western world, in the United States of America, we have tendencies of looking down Judging. and to a lower class, to homeless, to those that, that don't dress as well. We just have a tendency to look down this long self-righteous nose that's in front of our face and we, and we have a hard time just accepting people for who they are oh, and that they're the little ones of Jesus. And I'm as, I'm as guilty as he is. Oh, I can't my. speak to everybody else, but I'm as guilty as he is. Oh my God. Wait, hey, <laughs> no way. We won't believe that. You know, uh, do not judge a book by its cover. There's always a story. There's always a, a more, there's more to it than we know. There's more to it than we understand. And we cannot judge someone simply by the situation that they're in right now. Because these people who are poor and needy, oh my God, are they depending on God? Yes. For their bread, for their water, for their shelter. For everything. And Jesus is saying over and over and over. Do not despise. Do not hinder. Receive this little one. These are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. But even if you have wealth. Even if you have a nice home. Even if you have a Maserati in the driveway or the garage. We still I have to be dependent on the father. We cannot lose being a child to our father. That is the bottom line. If we lose that, I'm not sure you're saved. I was. I was gonna. I was taking a deep breath before I said it. I but said you it. may have lost your salvation because where are you then if you're not dependent on the father? You He's have become source. yourself. God, you become your your own idol. Self-sufficiency. And that is not in the kingdom of heaven. 
All so, right. So let's see how the father guards these little ones who are desperately aware of their need for him it's in revelation, by the way, uh, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels, oh, oh, excuse me, there's angels assigned to these little ones. Uh, and they're always before the face of God. So you really don't want to mess with them. Uh, so what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, what verse is that? Verse 12. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them, like one of these little ones, goes astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search out the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that were on the mountain that didn't stray. So it is the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones. So it is it's not, not the will. Oh, of my father. gracious. Thank you. So it is not <laughs> the will of my father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. He's going after, he chases after, he protects, he guards, he nourishes. He is a good shepherd and, and, and passionately searching out the little ones who are dependent, living a life of dependence upon him, recognizing that they cannot do it on their own, have to have his word as a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path, looking constantly for directions and resource of the Father. Come on and preach. Amen. Good. Okay, Barbara, verse uh, 15. Moreover, in addition to, I've said all that to say this, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. How far? As far as you want to talk about, baby. <laughs> and as surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's right. So, verse 15. So, verse 15. This is strictly like Jerry said earlier, the ethics of the church, the ethic handbook of the church. This is strictly what is how you are to handle conflicts within your church, among brothers, among sisters. Um, the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Okay. Yes. A believer, a fellow believer. Um, and if they have Christ living in their heart, desiring to live at peace with one another, desiring to pursue peace, it will be settled without having to take it before the church. And so uh, there is a lot of truth, a lot of support um, when the mouth of two or three witnesses may the truth be established. That is a very common statement that's used even in the world in secular situations but it comes because, from Deuteronomy. because it is a um it is a logical understanding of how to establish truth it is as comes it is a quote that jesus quotes from deuteronomy 17 verse 6 um and what we we talked about the binding Verse 18. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, what, I ain't ready to go there yet. Oh. Okay. So uh, here, uh, if your brother <laughs> if your brother sins against him, you, you go to him with what kind of attitude? What is your attitude when, what, what is your motive here uh, 
when you approach your brother. You go to reconciliation. Exactly. You are your whole motive is not vengeance. It's not payback. It's not let me show you how good I am. But or how it, bad you are. But it, you're doing something against me. But we approach our brother in humility, in love, and with an attitude of reconciliation. And by doing it this way, uh, there is great conviction that falls uh, when a person approaches you, approaches me, when I have messed up, when they come to me with this approach, it the the conviction power of the Holy Spirit is is unmeasurable. Okay, I speak from experience on this. Uh, I have I have had uh, opportunity to offend people. <laughs> I have taken opportunity to offend people. I, I am. Don't believe I, that, Jerry. Don't you believe that? You don't offend anybody, brother. <laughs> um, I have, uh, I, I have, I have demonstrated the ability to offend people several times, and a dear brother, <laughs> a dear brother of mine, uh, in fact, he was my blood brother, he is my blood brother, came to me, and with tears running down his face, came to me and explained to me how I had hurt him him, not only him, but one of his best friends, and had uh, caused a wedge to be driven between uh, my brother and his friend. And, and But he came with humility. He came with love. He came with uh, an attitude of reconciliation. And let me tell you what, I wrote his friend a letter. And I apologized. I sent a gift to my brother's friend. His name was EJ. And uh, it's a, a, a long friend of our family. And when I found out that I had offended EJ, it broke my heart. Oh, bless your heart. But, but it was the attitude that my brother came in to begin with that released the Holy Spirit to work in such a powerful way that it, it, it just broke me down. That's good, Jerry. So if you, let me say it this way, when someone sins against you, not if, but when, because people will let us down. I will let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. But when your brother sins against you, go and tell him. Okay? Then you notice the progression. Uh, take someone with you. And he re if he refuses to listen, go to the body of the church. Okay? So what I see here is there are no lone rangers. There are no isolated, we are not to be isolated islands. We are to be a community of believers. And Jesus gives us the ethics of how we are to respond one to another. When, not if, but when conflict occurs, he gives us the guidelines to how to resolve conflict. Isn't that precious? Isn't that, isn't that so godlike? God like. <laughs> Thank you. He knows it's going to happen. Yes. So he gives us the way out so that we do not sin. Hallelujah. All That's right. Good testimony there, Jerry. Thank you, sir. Uh, I lived it and I, and I cried a lot over that. One. Uh, verse 18. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, uh, there's a lot of teaching on that. And there's a lot of false teaching on that. We taught it in when we were on Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Yes. Here he is saying it again. Here so, he is saying it again. Uh, there must be something to it. And it must be uh, worth repeating. And let's look at it again. 
Uh, in other translations, it says, what is a yes in heaven, you say yes on earth. And what is no in heaven, you say no on earth. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So we align ourselves to whatever is bound or loosed in heaven. Then we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We align with that. And then our prayer and our agreement with heaven is explained in the next verse. Amen. Verse 19. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth, about anything you say, it will be done of them by my Father in heaven. Or whatever you bind on earth, if it's bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth, is it loosed in heaven? Well, if the two of you can agree, it shall be done unto you. You got anything to say? Okay. Uh, now, uh, the Amplified Bible says... If two of you can make symphony, Andy, when we can harmonize together, when we're in tune with one another, when we can blend, the human voice can only make one note. Huh? The human voice can only make one note. But unlike a guitar if you got a six string guitar it can make oh, six, oh, six I notes hear, okay i understand what you mean one so, note at a time one note at a time gotcha. okay thank you but when we harmonize we can bring a symphony of voices because no. two or three agree three of us can soprano alto and tenor sounds almost like a quartet but you need a bass in a quartet so if the two or three agree on it sh shall be done one version said and it shall be done by my father in heaven or, another verse another translation says and my father goes into action hallelujah to make it happen that's the message right that's the message yes Peterson's message Bible or where two or three are gathered in my name there I am hallelujah <laughs> Woo! don't get me started on I am now I do want to interject here so she wasn't gonna get me started on I am no <laughs> we'll never get to the end of the chapter <sighs> But it says where two or three are gathered together in my name. That's like right here. That's exactly right. We say Encour that every day I, in group. I encourage you to find someone in your day-to-day -day life. You're coming in, you're going out, your day-to-day -day life. Preferably a spouse is perfect, but someone that you can agree with on a regular basis in everyday life situations. And then God is right there in the midst of your every day. You're coming in, you're going out, you're rising up, you're laying down. God is right there with you. His midst, his presence is right there in your room, in your house. Because if we can't get God in our house, how are we going to get God in our nation? We have to get God in our house first. You can't have God at, at, at Walmart yeah. if you don't have him in your house. That's right. Hallelujah. And my closest neighbor, to love my neighbor as myself, this is my closest neighbor right here. That's my closest neighbor. And if I, I have to love my closest neighbor as myself, then if I can't love him, forget the, the folks next door. We have to, Jesus wants it right here before we take it to the world. Greatest place to practice. This is the greatest place to practice. Therefore, I am among you. I am among you. For two or three are gathered in my name. There I am. 
Hallelujah. That's Old Testament right there. That is, that's uh, what uh, God told Moses to tell Pharaoh. Tell him I am. I am. So uh, when, uh, when the, get to the end of the I don't know if we're going to get to the end of this or not. Uh, can, okay. we, can we go 10 minutes over since we started 10 minutes late? Permission, please. Okay. You guys Everybody's are got yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll have to take an offering today for the for the extra <laughs> minutes or something. Okay. So I am is what Jesus said to the Romans as they came to uh, arrest him in the garden. He's, they said, are, are you the Christ? And he said, I am. And oh, they fell out on the floor, on the ground right there. So there is power in the, when Jesus says, I am, hallelujah. Ooh, that's good. <clears throat> Okay, Barbara, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Verse 21 through and 22. So, uh, so seven times 70 in one day, that is what he's talking about? He's uh, yes, seven that is exactly what he's talking about. Seven times 70 times in one day. So, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, we have to tell them that I'm rabbis, sorry. let's start from the beginning. Okay. The rabbis actually taught in the synagogue that it was sufficient to forgive someone who offended you three times in one day. So three times in one day the, was the rabbi's teaching for sufficient forgiveness. So when Peter asked the question, should I forgive them up to seven times? He was being very generous. He thought he was going way above and beyond. More than twice as much. More than twice as much. Twice as much plus one. And so he thought he was... That's sure that that was the perfect number to be forgiven somebody. And it was the perfect number. Oh, man. But... But Jesus said, uh, no. uh, how do you say, no, no. <laughs> I do not say to you seven times, but seven times, 70 seven. times seven, which is 490. And let's just say that uh, you're awake for 18 hours in a day. So, uh, 18 hours, 470. That's every uh, two minutes and 15 seconds. Like I said, it's a perfect practice ground right here with the one you live. It's a perfect place to practice. Every two minutes and 15 seconds. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. It was my, my fault. fault. Please, Please forgive, forgive me. me. I'll do my best not to do that again today. Today. Just get more. <laughs> Another uh, 490 tomorrow but uh, <laughs> and we have okay jesus is teaching on forgiveness okay he's fixing to go into we, we just talked about uh if your brother sins against you what do you do you go with an attitude of humility reconciliation desiring uh with an attitude of forgiveness second thing uh, verse 21, how many times? Seven times 70, every uh, two minutes and, and 15 seconds. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven will be compared to a king. Go ahead and read. Okay, hey, will be like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, and when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to, to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and that all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. And then the master of the servant had, was moved with compassion. Well, how was Jesus moved with the multitude? Move. Jesus was moved with compassion. The master released him and forgave him the debt. 
But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servant saw, when his fellow servant saw that he had done, they went, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that he had done. And when his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Did you not also have, the, have had compassion on your fellow servant? just as I have had pity on you. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Wow. Oh, here we're talking about the ethics of the church the ethics of the body of Christ. And so we must forgive 490 times a day. And to what level, to what um, monetary value must we forgive? So he owed him uh, 10,000, what does it say? Uh, yeah, 10,000 talents. In today's monetary, that's, Six billion, like with a B, six billion dollars. A uncomprehendable, unpayable amount to be returned. How this man uh, racked up this debt, we don't know. All we know is that in this parable, Jesus said he had a debt of six billion dollars uh, forgiven him. It, it, it seems to me that the, the servant knew how to manipulate. He got down low, he fell on his knees, he begged, and he, he, he promised to pay back, knowing good and well that he couldn't pay six, back, six billion dollars back. Uh, but then he went and uh, found one of his fellow servants that owed him 12,000 denarii. 12,000 20 weeks of common labor. Yeah, that's that's a, a substantial amount of money that somebody might owe you $12,000. But in comparison to $6 billion, that, that's not even a drop in the bucket. I mean, that's like a, a, a net tear in comparison. Uh, so he seized him. Now the the king did not choke and 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 seize his servant. He simply brought him into his presence. But you see what this man did? He grabbed him by the throat and choked him. He seized him around the head and neck and threw him up against the wall. He didn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but he did throw him in prison. But guess what? Just like all these other principles that we've talked about tonight, somebody is watching. Somebody is watching. Somebody is watching you. Somebody is watching me. Somebody is watching every one of us. And somebody was watching, and his fellow servant saw what had taken place. You see that in verse 31? And guess what? They went and told their master, nah, 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 nah. This man messed up. No. <laughs> Uh, they went and told the master, and the master brought him back in the second time. Oh, my goodness. You wicked, you wicked servant, it says in verse 32. I forgave you all that $6 billion of debt because you pleaded with me. You can't have mercy on your fellow servant as I had for you. I just want to know, 
Does anybody not need forgiveness? Does anybody in this life can live through life without forgiveness? Well, we all need forgiveness. And it is God's nature. It is his nature. It is the spirit and the nature of God, according to Exodus chapter 34, verse 9, to forgive us, to forgive sin, to forgive iniquity, to, to forgive. And if we have to have forgiveness, but we can't give forgiveness. So, Jerry, we haven't talked about this beforehand, but I, I want to remind each one of our listeners what we talked about in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 14 says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Or oh, they talking but about $6 million. I want you, Jerry, to talk about verse 34. We've discussed this in the past and it won't be hard for you to recall it. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. How are you going to pay a debt when you're in prison? The torturers today, when we do, when we hold unforgiveness against a fellow particular, a fellow believer, we start getting migraines, ulcers. Torturers can, can manifest in our in our bodies when unforgiveness is kept inside. We then the unforgiveness then has to work out. We can't carry that weight. That's why Jesus died to take that weight of sin off of us. Of As we carry the weight of the unforgiveness then our bodies start turning it over into possibly ulcers, uh, sickness, headaches. And depending upon how bad the unforgiveness is, it can go into all kinds of things. Cancer. So, so just remember what the word says. That if we don't forgive, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. And as the par this is a parable. Remember, this is a parable. Pa doctrines are not built on parables. Okay? But the illustration here is that the master delivered the servant who was unforgiving over to torture. Unforgiveness. Carrying unforgiveness is like hating the rat so bad you start eating the rat poison and expecting the rat to die. Unforgiveness has no place in the kingdom of God. Un forgiveness, accepting forgiveness and operating in forgiveness is a basic principle of ethics. We have to have forgiveness and we have to give forgiveness. Amen. So thank you all for, for coming. That's uh, we. And I, I just want to reiterate that these uh, Bible studies are simply a survey. We do our best not to get in depth. We occasionally um, take a few little plunges, but uh, we just want to uh, not a in and understand that uh, it is our, our a privilege and honor uh, to open up the scripture, but there's an awful lot here that... Uh, that is opened up for us to receive. And I challenge each one of you to, to read, go back and read and ask the Holy Spirit to show you. And, and please uh, come next week after reading chapter 19. Um, and we will do it again. It would just be a joy and a thrill to, to open God's word and, and, and share with each of you uh, next week. So, uh, with that, uh, Barbara's going to close in prayer, and uh, we'll open up the uh, chat room for 
discussion. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank, thank you, Lord, you, that your word thank brings you, light to our soul, thank light you, to Father. our spirit. Thank you. Brings Father. light to our to our life. Thank you, Father. So, Father, we thank you that you've taught us how to live with brothers and sisters in harmony. Thank you, Lord, that we do not despise the little ones, those of, of that are new in the faith. We thank you, Lord, that we will become like children. Amen. Childlike faith Amen. and be solely dependent upon you, our Father, which is in heaven. And Father, teach us to forgive. Teach us to forgive like you have forgiven us. For Live. much is forgiven. To those that much is forgiven, much is required. So, Father... You have forgiven us of much sin. So, Father, you require us to forgive as well. Bless these people, each one of them, bless their homes. May the presence of Jesus flood their, their bedrooms, their living rooms, their dens. Every day this week, in the name of Jesus, I just bless them with Hallelujah. the presence of God. Yes, Lord. We in release Jesus the blessing. Name. We release Amen. the blessing. Jesus' name. Thank you, Barbara and Jerry. As usual, y'all done an outstanding job. Thank you. Very I'm sorry for sorry for going over. We apologize. Sorry for being late. Oh, no, thank you. Allowed to make a mistake. That's one. That's your first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, folks. If you're watching this video, I'll be very brief. If you're still watching it, it may be a year from now or or whenever I get it up. So at least a week from now. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is if you want to know that you have salvation through Jesus and really understand why we're all gathered here, um, go to deliveranterevolution.org, click the contact us link. Send me that. I will respond to you. I'll invite you to connect with us on Skype and come to the groups. There's groups during the day for deliverance and healing and Christ coaching and and learning and it's basically everything barbara and jerry go through every thursday just probably a lot more deeper and it's in action in other words it's what they're teaching us we act out forgiveness we talk about how do we do forgiveness uh we talk about how we deal with uh, uh, things in the unseen world so uh it's just the deeper level of what they're discussing here because we go straight out of the word of god so if you want to understand that Go to contact us, deliverancerevolution.org, okay? And we love you very much. We will help you with your salvation and answer questions about baptism and sprinkling versus full submersion, but mainly we'll teach you how to have a full-on relationship with Jesus and walk in power and authority, not religion, but really have a relationship with Jesus. So we love you and thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks. God bless. Bye -bye. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Flaming wide these gates, let's see his kingdom come.